On today's Retro Tech Repair, we're going to be repairing this Acorn Electron that I bought spares or repair on eBay. And maybe this one too. So I recently bought an Acorn Electron spares or repair on eBay. And then a couple of weeks after that I saw a job lot of retro tech and computers that also contained an Acorn Electron. So I ended up with two. Let's take a look at the first one. Sometimes you see something advertised on eBay, or, or I do, and I just can't resist it because the price is right. So let's take a look at the eBay listing for this one. Acron Electron, retro console computer, untested, retro rare. So it's a little unfortunate perhaps that the seller described it as an Acron Electron is of course an Acorn Electron. That might explain why it sold for the princely sum of £11, including shipping. And here is the seller's description. Acron Electron Retro Console Computer comes with a power supply. When plugged in, nothing happens, but I have no idea about this machine, so I wouldn't know how to test it. Sold as is, no returns. So here we have it then. Our Acron or Acorn Electron seems to be in... You know, it's yellowed, but it's not in bad cosmetic condition. Still has the original expansion cable cover there, which is quite nice. No obvious burns or marks, all the feet are intact. It's just a little bit yellowed with age. It did come with a power supply. Uh, it does have some of the original plastic film over the label. It looks like this is an AC power supply, uh, 220 to 40 volts AC in, 19 volts AC out at 14 watts. So a quick look at that for anybody who might be looking to try and find a power supply for an Acorn Electron. So um, what I did notice though about this power supply is when I look at it I see right away that it has a frayed connection or a frayed cable right here at the connection to the power supply itself. So hopefully you can see that now. This cable is more or less snapped, in fact I think perhaps it has snapped right here at the input or output from the power supply. So the first thing we need to do is try and get some AC power, and that is the 19 volts AC power, out of this power supply. So I'm expecting this to be a fairly simple affair inside. I'd imagine it's just a transformer, presumably connected to this uh, AC input here. And if the output is AC, then there probably won't be a voltage regulator or anything. It probably just connects straight to that AC output. So, as we predicted, our power supply is a pretty simple affair inside. There is just a live and a neutral wire coming in here. They connect presumably to the live and the neutral prongs of our three pin plug here. There doesn't appear to be any connection to the ground plug, uh, certainly not electrically. And so that is there probably just to open the shutters as you plug this in. Very simple, there's no regulator in here, there's no smoothing caps or anything. It's literally just AC in on two wires and then 19 volts apparently AC out on the other two. Uh, cable is completely severed here now, probably something to do with me interacting with it to some extent. So really we just need to get this unsoldered here and get it soldered back on at this side. And looking at this, I don't think I'm going to be able to save this strain relief. It looks like that is pretty tightly welded in there. And I'm not going to be able to get the cable to move out of that in order to save it. So probably what I'm going to do then is I'll just nip it off at this side and then we'll strip the cable back. All right, so we just need to unsolder it now from our transformer. There we are. And it looks like there might be some kind of mechanical connection around there. So it's worth maybe getting these terminals cleaned off to see if there's a, like a wrap or something that I can do around these prior to me soldering the new ends of this on. And indeed there is. I don't know if you can see that, but there's a couple of C-shaped kind of spaces in 
the tabs to this transformer that I can wrap the new cable or the existing cable now slightly shorter around. So I'm going to try and see if I can save this strain relief and I think the answer is probably going to be no, but we'll take a quick look anyway. Obviously these parts aren't designed to be reused and I'm just wondering whether I can cut through it enough to be able to save some of it. Really just for cosmetic reasons. Yeah, I really feel I'm kind of through that now. I'm nearly coming out the other side. So this originally would have been kind of molded over this cable. So I'm really dependent upon it leaving a cavity that I can get the new cable into. So I was able to, was able to extract some of that. Give myself plenty to work at. Actually it would be the other way around, wouldn't it? We'll see if we can get any of this kind of back in to where the old one came from. Well, you know, maybe we can. It's not great, is it? But it, it's not terrible either. That's much better than just, uh, oh, if I did cut all the way through it, that's better hopefully than uh, just tying a knot in it. So let's try that now. And that will slide in something like that. And then we'll solder the new wires, well, the new ends of the wires back onto here. And I'll probably just put a little knot in there too, just to add some real strain relief there, given that this now is largely cosmetic. And I'll probably put a little bit of super glue or something on this to hold it together. And here is our super glued strain relief. Now, from this side, it looks fine. From the other, of course, it's a little bit rough because that's where I cut it. But I think all in all, that's better than it not being there at all. And now we have hopefully a good cable, both sides of it. I'm probably gonna tie a knot in this side of it so that we have a little bit of additional strain relief given that it's no longer injection molded in there. That might not really be necessary, uh, but I'm chosen to do it anyway. If you have any comments on whether you think that's a good idea or a bad, please leave a comment in the comment section. For now though, we need to get it soldered back into our power supply. I'll take a look at that because I'm soldering it from a slightly weird angle. I think that's okay. Perhaps not beautiful, but hopefully effective. So let's get this assembled. We'll check the voltage from it and we'll see if we can now use it to power our Acorn Electron. All right, so I'm going to plug this in off camera because that happens to be where my plug is. And then we'll measure the voltage using our multimeter on the DC jack that would ordinarily go into the Acorn. So let's just measure now if we have voltage coming off this power supply. 21 volts, a little high perhaps, but my guess is it's going to go through some voltage regulation inside the electron. So I'm not too worried about that, but at least now it is working and we've got a fairly consistent, stable AC supply from our power supply, which we can use to try and power our Acorn electron. Well, that's promising. And yes, I know, I should have checked the internal voltage regulation before I connected up the electron. But we're going to leave this particular machine for now and come back to it a little bit later in the video. In the meantime, let's take a look at our second Acorn Electron. So here we have it, our Acorn Electron. I'm not going to show you the eBay listing for this one because it was bought as part of a job lot. And if you look at my unboxing 30 kilos of RetroTech in there, you'll see that this was one of those items. And it came with this Acorn Electron, which as you may or may not be able to see if I move the light in there, is really kind of grubby. And fortunately, it also came with a power supply. So I think testing the power supply is going to be the first thing that we do. Okay, so we have our meter on volts AC and we have our power supply plugged in and we're just gonna measure the voltage across there. Okay, 20.7, I'm quite happy with that. 
So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open it up and take some voltage measurements inside and there's a reason for that. That is because this is 19 or 20 volts AC. That is not the voltage that our Acorn Electron electronics are running off. There's going to be another power supply in there that's going to convert that into the voltage for the logic board and I want to measure the voltages on that before I go ahead and power up the Electron's electronics kind of computer digital electronics. So the next thing we're going to do is open it up. It looks like just four screws secure this. There's no evidence of any anti-tamper measures like you might see on a Commodore 64 or something like that. Let's have a look inside. All right, there's a crusty looking edge connector here. Okay. Okay, so there's the back of our keyboard assembly. Uh, looks like it's a Aztec product or perhaps made for Acorn by Aztec. And then in here, this is interesting. If you look at that keyboard connector, you see there was an awful lot of corrosion around that keyboard connector there. Um, interesting. Little speaker on the back, 6502 processor, presumably. Although it says 6502A, yeah, that's the one. This presumably is the ULA, uh, Uncommitted Logic Array, which replaced a lot of the chips in the BBC Micro. And then here are our voltages going on to the main logic board. And these are the voltages, these DC voltages, plus and minus five volts that I wanted to measure here before I went ahead and powered up the board. This looks like it's the AC straight through, and then maybe that goes straight off to the edge connector in case you have any 19 volts AC uh, equipment that you want to power off that. Um, but what we're really looking for here is, I'm gonna disconnect this, and I'm gonna go to look for plus and minus five volts on that board, and then if that's good, We'll plug it in and we'll see what happens next. And we're going to go this time onto DC volts and I'm just going to unplug this connector here. There we go, 5.12 volts and then minus 4.96 volts. So yeah, plus and minus 5 volts, I think we're good. Let's connect this up now to a TV and see how that works. So something my Spectrum didn't have and another reason that I kind of liked my Electron was it has a video out. So no need to tune in the TV for this one. I can just plug in a composite cable. Now it's just video because the sound came out of a speaker that we saw earlier on in the back of this Electron. So we just need to plug in the video out cable and into the composite input of the TV. And then we'll go ahead and take our power supply. There's no on off switch on this, just plugs in and we'll see what happens. Well, that's promising. This is an overlay from the TV there, but then you see it comes up straight away. We've got Acorn Electron Basic. Seems to work just fine, at least this far. Uh, so let's try the keyboard. Mm -hmm. So six doesn't seem to work. Q's kind of hit and miss. Y doesn't work, so 6 doesn't work, Y doesn't work, R doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, so there's clearly some keyboard problems with this. So let's go back to opening it up, and I think we're going to start by examining that connector that looks so flaky the first time out. Again, just kind of removing this ribbon cable here, as gently as I can, in order not to do any more damage. Now, just having a quick look at the back, all of the solder connections look all right on the face of it. I probably need to take a magnifying glass to those to see in detail. And I don't see any kind of obvious breaks in the ribbon cable here. This connector is looking really dubious to me. So I'm going to look at this under a magnifying glass now and see if I can get a better idea of what those deposits might be. And what can I say? Well, I looked at them under a magnifying glass and all I can really say is they are deeply unpleasant. They just look like kind of hairs or something like that. I'm really not sure what they are, but uh, yeah, not, not nice. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to disconnect this, take the printed circuit aboard out of the plastics so that will give us a good chance to clean the plastic, see if there's anything going on underneath there as well, clean off that connector, and then we'll try our keyboard again.
by and large, doesn't look too bad. That connector though, really needs to get cleaned up. And we are going to start off cleaning that up with some IPA and uh, a toothbrush, an old toothbrush of course. I just knew I was gonna spill that, I nearly always do. It's a good job it evaporates quickly. If you think you know what that was, let me know whether it's from an insect or some other source, whether it's, I don't know what it was, it's horrible. There's definitely evidence of that same kind of fibrous material around this connector. I'm gonna dab that in the IPA, and I'm just gonna use this to exercise this connector a few times. Okay, let's try popping this back together now, and see if we've made any progress. And the short answer is, no, we didn't. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, six, still doesn't work. Q, W, E, R, only works some of the time. T, Y, Y doesn't work at all. And then after some persistence, M doesn't seem to work. Well, M sometimes works if you hit it hard, which implies that maybe there's either an electrical connection or something that's being made when you hit it hard or when you, when you wiggle it. Huh. When you wiggle it, it seems to improve it. And after some more persistence, M, 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 M. And then eventually, seems fine now. All right, so let's try with six. Six doesn't work. Press it and give it a good wiggle. It's coming back to life. Six, 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 six. So after some continued wiggling, I got it to the point where in fact all of the keys work. And we'll pick up the video at that point. It works all the time as do the other keys, but I'm still going to take this keyboard apart to clean it because it really is filthy. Apologize if you are just having your dinner there, but, uh, or your lunch. But there's actually a lot of kind of buildup of nasty hair and other nastiness on there. I don't know if you can see that. I'm trying to figure out how to get this uh, space bar off next. Yeah, and it looks like there are a couple of plastic tabs in here on the space bar. So I'm just going to try and slide those out of the way of the metal uh, kind of wire that's in there. I can't say this is the right way to do it, but hopefully it's going to work and I won't break anything. Fingers crossed, these plastics are probably quite brittle by now. All right, so that one's come off without too much trouble. And I think this one will probably do the same with a little bit of persuasion. Those were the tabs that I just pushed out of the way. They seem to be made out of a more flexible type of plastic. Hopefully you can see this in all its horrors now. Uh, yeah. So here is our dirty keyboard. Let's go ahead and get that cleaned up. I'm just gonna carry on working this dog hair out of here. Well, that's a good amount of the dog hair or whatever it was collected up. Really very unpleasant, you can see the uh, well, I don't know if you can catch it, but there's a lot of dust in the room here. Really not very nice at all. Uh, we'll get that cleaned up out of the way, and then I'll get the rest of this cleaned up, I think, with some IPA. Okay, so here's our keyboard now cleaned off after its IPA experience. We'll give that a few more minutes to dry. In the meantime, I'm going to clean the plastics, and the way I'm just going to clean these plastics is just with some soapy water. I don't know if that's the right thing, uh, but I'm hoping so. Uh, these are quite dirty. It would respond probably really well to being retro brightened, but then when I look at the exterior color compared to the interior color where it's not had the UV exposure, actually, it's not too far from the original color. It looks like it might have yellowed, but when you put the two together, I think when it's cleaned up, it's not gonna be that different. So I'm not sure retro brighting is actually the right thing to do with this particular Acorn Electron. So I'm just gonna get this cleaned up in some soapy water and then I'll bring it back to you and show you again when I've done that.
So despite my promises, I'm not going to do that just yet because all is still not well with our electron. So obviously there's something wrong with our acorn electron. It just seems to want to print L's and I don't really know why. I've spent a lot of time cleaning this keyboard. So it would be interesting to do a couple of things. Firstly, since L seems to be the problem, I'm going to measure the resistance across the L key and just trace that through the rest of the circuit, see if I can figure that out. No, that wasn't the problem. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try moving this keyboard and see if the problem moves with it, because I'm very fortunate that in fact I happen to have this. This of course is the first Acorn Electron that we saw earlier in the video. And it has some faults of its own, but I don't think the keyboard is one of them. So I'm tempted to take the keyboard out of this and connect it up to this PCA and we'll see if the problem goes with the keyboard or goes with the computer printed circuit assembly. I'm not totally convinced Shift is working as it should, but by and large, I think this is a better keyboard. So let's open this one up and see what's inside. And there we are. Keyboard on the face of it looks identical, but the printed circuit assembly is quite different. So here's a quick comparison of the two side by side, and I'm not going to go into too much boring detail. The board at the top of your display is an Issue 2 board, and the board at the bottom is an Issue 6. The Issue 2 board includes a Ferranti ULA fabricated in a ceramic package mounted on a socket. The Issue 6 board has a different ULA soldered directly to the board. Other differences include the layout changes and the use of a dual inline RAM configuration in the top board and some kind of RAM module in the bottom board. I'm sure there are lots of other changes and there's lots of information on the internet about the various versions of board. What I found interesting was the keyboard connector. The board also has a buildup of something around the bottom of that connector where the keyboard was, which is sort of interesting. I don't know why it has done that. It's not as pronounced as it was on this one, but it's there. So the next thing to do for me is to take a look at these now, to use the keyboard that came with this one, which I think is basically a good keyboard, connect it onto this motherboard and see if the problem stays with the motherboard or it moves with the keyboard. So the keyboards in the two Acorn electrons looked identical. So here we have the printed circuit board from the second electron that was displaying the spontaneous key presses and which we had the keyboard problems with from the start, connected to the keyboard which came from the first electron, which we still haven't fully diagnosed. And we're just going to hook it up to the TV now and see how it performs. Okay, so initial impressions are good. We don't have the spontaneous key presses that we had originally. So let's just see if the keys work. All right, so shift doesn't seem to work. Oh dear. So at this stage, perhaps a little discouraged, I decided to clean the connector on the new keyboard, let's call it the new keyboard, with some IPA. Okay, and cleaning up that connector with IPA seems to have done it. All I did was I poured some IPA into it and just worked it back and forth on that connector a little bit, and that seems to have done it. So hopefully now shift works, and all the other keys do. So I'm going to give this a superficial clean rather than stripping it all back. I'm going to reassemble this into one working Acorn Electron, and then hopefully we'll be able to take a quick look at that. From then on, I might spend some more time diagnosing the broken parts from the two electrons that we had. But in the meantime, I am going to have, hopefully, a fully working Acorn Electron, which is good news. Okay, so it's the following day now, and I'm just going to explain what we have here. This is the contents of our issue two Acorn Electron, the one which uh, we bought spares or repair, or I bought spares or repair, the issue two version. And this was the one that had the electronics, main electronics that weren't quite working properly. And this is the keyboard from the one that we got spares or repair as part of the job lot. So the faulty keyboard from the job lot and the faulty printed circuit assembly from the issue two. And so we have the very worst parts here. Uh, of the two electrons. Now the ones that the best parts were assembled into this and we have now fully working acorn electron there. So what we're trying to do now is see if we can repair the worst parts that were left and turn those into a working machine too because it'd be very nice to get two working machines. Let's just connect this up. Okay and it came up straight away uh, but it's doing the old L thing. Now I'm going to let it do that for a while because what I'd found with this particular electron is that would run for a while and then it would uh, potentially it would crash again. So I'm going to let this run for a little bit and we'll see if it continues to crash. And okay we didn't have to wait very long before it started to deteriorate. This is just a few seconds later 
uh, wish I'd let the camera rolling actually because it would have given you some idea and you see this is already starting to go and then this is starting to get pretty warm now. If I reset this. Oh, it's recovered. Now, uh, interestingly, I think on this version, if you hit escape, I think actually it does kind of reset the processor, but again, uh, the display has gone. And this is what's been happening when I have tried to use this for any period of time. So I think what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and remove this ULA, clean up that connector, and then try this again and see if we get something stable and then we can turn our attention to the keyboard. So I did eventually manage to remove the ULA. Uh, I got the socket holder off, but I'm not going to try and explain how I did that because I'm pretty sure I didn't do it right. I kind of stuck a screwdriver in there and prized it off from the corners, but in doing so, I think I may have damaged the socket. So I'm not going to say that's the right way to do it. I'm pretty sure there has to be a better way. But the IC itself just kind of sits in there resting on those pins. It's not soldered in place or uh, mechanically engaged other than via this clip. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to clean off the chip with some IPA. I'm going to pop it in there and give it a good wiggle, but I'm not going to get too involved in trying to clean off these contacts because my worry is that I'll just put fibers on from a cotton bud or something else and I'll just make the situation worse. Well, obviously that didn't go very well. So instead I decided to use a fiberglass pencil to clean off the contacts on the ULA. And as we'll see in a minute, that seemed to resolve the problem. But we still have the problem with the keyboard. By this stage, I'd removed the foam pad that protects the ribbon cable from the keyboard to see if there was anything interesting underneath, but there wasn't. So I came up with another plan to try and diagnose the problem. So I'm going to take the L key out of the keyboard assembly and see if when I connect everything up, it still repeatedly prints L. And if that's the case, then we can assume that it's not the key itself that's at fault. And if it is the case, then we'll be able to get the key out and maybe have a look at it in more detail. Now we need to take the key out from the front. So we need to get some tweezers or something in there just to squeeze that together to be able to lift it out. Okay, so here is our troublesome key. Perhaps. All right, so two things we need to test now. Let's put that on the bench and we'll measure the resistance across it. So there is no continuity when it's not pressed. And then it's perhaps not a clean contact there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, although I'm beginning to think that actually that switch is the problem. So we'll pop that aside and we'll hook it up to our electron and we'll see if we still have the problem with the repeated keys appearing. And it looks like no, it does not. Without this troublesome L key in there, we don't get the repeated Ls drawn on the display. So I'm just going to go through the other keys, see if we have any that are behaving intermittently. We'll take all of those out. We're going to try and clean them by immersing them in IPA or something like that. So the good news is that now all of the keys behave exactly as they should. The bad news is that when I'm successful at repairing something like I have been with this, I sometimes get so excited that I forget to shoot some demonstration footage of everything working as it should to put at the end of the video. This is one of those examples, so if you're expecting an amazing demonstration of the fantastic abilities of the Acorn Electron at the end of the video, I'm sorry but you're going to be disappointed. But I do hope that you've enjoyed the video of me systematically hitting keys on which, apart from the absence of an L key, is a perfectly working Acorn Electron. But unfortunately a computer which works in every way apart from an L key isn't particularly useful, particularly if you want to print Hello World. So I left the key switch soaking in IPA overnight and of course I neglected to film that too. So here's some footage of me soldering the key switch back into the keyboard. It's the same key switch that you saw me unsolder just a few seconds ago, and you didn't see me do anything to it in between. So did our off-camera IPA soaking solve the problem? In short, 
Yes. So as I hurriedly assemble the Acorn Electron, I'd just like to send a huge thank you to all of my subscribers, old and new. It really does make an enormous difference to have all of you with me and read all of your great comments and feedback. I'm genuinely sorry that I don't have more video footage of the finished Acorn Electrons to show you today. I promise you I did end up with two fully working and stable Acorn Electrons, and I also promise that for the next repair, no matter what it is, I'll be sure to shoot plenty of video footage of everything working just as it should in order that I can demonstrate the successful repair to you. I hope that you've enjoyed the video today nonetheless, and until next time, I'd just like to thank you so much for watching Retro Tech Repair. <laughs> And off we come with a lid.